Wallace Stegner was an author, a Pulitzer Prize winner, a, his, a history teacher, a philosopher, and a professor at Stanford University. He made a most compelling challenge to us. If I can pull it up. Stegner said, if we have both consciousness and choice, then we also have responsibility, especially the responsibility to try to understand. I invite you today to join me as we try to understand what I believe to be is the greatest challenge of the 21st century. And we're going to discuss the origins of it and the possible solutions for it. You see, in 2050, if 10 billion people, and that's the estimated population at that time, consume what an average American does, it will take the resources of four Earths. And of course, we don't have four Earths. But the greatest migration in human history is going on right now, as hundreds of millions of people now and over the next several decades will move from rural America to urban areas and join a middle class whose expectations match yours. So how do you feed a, a world in 2050 with expectations like yours? Well, I'm gonna show you my recipe and discuss it with you. First, we need to grow more food. Secondly, we certainly have to do it more efficiently. And third, we have to do it to reduce in ways that we reduce ag's footprint on our environment. We absolutely have to reduce waste. And we have to do it sustainably. And when I say sustainable, I mean that we don't limit the opportunities for the future by the decisions we make in the present. I'm going to use a kaleidoscope image today to talk about this, these, uh, about agriculture and this grand challenge of feeding 20, uh, 20, uh, in 10 billion people in 2050. So let's take a look through the kaleidoscope. Production agriculture in my lifetime, every aspect of it is twice as, more, twice as productive as it was when I was a child, and in many aspects, it's three or four times as, uh, as productive. And from a unit of food produced, we are using less water and less energy every year. And if you look at it in terms of corn, the, bo the, the bottom line of that graph, the white line, shows the, the increase, the steady per, uh, increase of corn in America, or in South Dakota, at two bushels per acre, per acre per year. And the top line is the genetic potential of corn as measured by, in South Dakota, measured by SDSU scientists. And that's three bushels per, per year, per acre per year. But it's the blue arrow that I want you to focus on. It's that divergence in those lines because the hope of the 2050 challenge lies in capturing that, un, uh, that potential yield. And that exists for every crop and every livestock species in the food system. And we absolutely must capture it. Agriculture is more diverse than I think any of you know. I have the privilege of traveling across the United States. I visited hundreds of farms and ranches and gardens and orchards, and I will tell you that the diversity not only of the crops, but also the cropping systems is amazing. I've seen communities be fed from the gardens within and around them, and I've seen ranches and farms the size of townships that feed communities halfway around the world. And it's more technical than you can imagine, and it will only become more technical in the future. As we invest $2 billion a year in public and private money in agricultural research in things like soil microbiology and precision agriculture. But let's change the perspective and look through the kaleidoscope in a different way and, and, and acknowledge that we've had epic problems as portrayed in this picture 
of the Dust Bowl in South Dakota and the soil erosion that took place then. And sadly, soil erosion remains a problem for agriculture. And, the, and, and I want to leave you with an, uh, the knowledge and the understanding that we are not in control. Our fathers and grandfathers built a series of dams up the Missouri River's up the Missouri River, the longest river in the United States, to stop the flooding that, that had ravaged the Missouri River uh, cities and communities and farms since settlement. And in 2011, that system failed because we're not in control of everything, as much as we'd like to think we are. And there are unintended consequences to our actions, and I will tell you that species the loss of species diversity is not only a problem for South America, it's a problem for the Great Plains of North America. And we must cope with it and acknowledge it and deal with it. In the next few months, in the next days actually, the farms around this community will harvest millions and millions of bushels of grain and that grain for all intensive purposes, will be hauled out on the railroad that runs next to this building over the next year to, work, to ports and, and communities around the world. And <clears throat> tomorrow afternoon, 400 Brookings children will take backpacks home with food supplements to get them to Monday morning and breakfast at school because they live in uh, food insecure homes and their future is at risk. And on top of that, we waste 35% of the food in the United States at our plates, in our refrigerators, and in our restaurants. And worldwide, that's 50%, but not at the plate, it's at the production system, storage, and transportation. But there's also good news and in the end, paradox and irony in all this, because as some cr people criticize agriculture uh, for mining the soils, research done at South Dakota State with 80,000 sa soil samples over 30 years show soil organic uh, matter in our soils increasing. South Dakota uh, farms are carbon sinks. Well, let's change our perspective and look backwards to the 1950s when one farmer fed 25 people. Today, a farmer feeds 155 people. And the, the, that 130 people, that simple math to create that number, is an enormous success story about unleashing agriculture, unleashing the capacity of human creativity and ingenuity for all the people in this room. Because if in 1950 we'd all be out harvesting soybeans right now and getting ready to milk cows, this is a very different world for all of us because of the success of American agriculture and its productivity. And, in, and when I was a child, my parents spent up to 25% of their disposable income on food for my brothers and my sister and I, and I think I got the lion's share, actually. And today, we spend 10% of our disposable income on food. And that 15 cents of every dollar that can be redirected to uplift our, our standard of living is important because we're building a billion-dollar football stadium in Minneapolis so we can all watch the Vikings. And 20 million Americans will take a cruise this year. And that 15 cents out of every dollar is fueling vacations and fifth wheel trailers bigger than most people's houses around the world. And it's fueling uh, early retirement. And it's paying for us to be able to take selfies on cell phones. So let's change the perspective 
and look at the variability in agriculture. As portrayed in this colorful slide, each one of those colors on that field represents a different soil type. And if you extrapolate that to a farm or a township, a county, a state, a nation, and a world, there's enormous variation in the soils of the world. But that's not where all the variation comes from. There's also topography and precipitation and, and growing length of growing season. And all of that variability adds up into enormous changes in levels of production between years, as we learned in 2012, or were reminded in 2012. And when we have enormous changes in productivity, we have enormous changes in price, don't we? Not only of commodities, but food for us. And with that, the, that comes enormous risk, not only for farmers, but also for communities. And if you don't believe me, look at the roots of the Arab Spring just a few years ago to Tunisia, to a food market where, where the Arab Spring all began and is now manifesting itself in continued uh, troubles in the Middle East. Food insecurity is a huge risk factor for all of us. So managing variability will be how we meet the 2050 challenge, and it'll be highly technical, but it won't be uh, scale dependent. It'll be about integrating everything so that we can optimize systems and build sustainability into food systems. So how do you feed the world in 2050? It's really not a recipe, it's a precise prescription. I'd like to end with a story of my grandfather who made a commitment to me as a child as I was riding with him across the prairies of his ranch in western South Dakota that he would leave his ranch in better shape than, he, than it was when he bought it in the, after the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. And he kept that covenant. He kept that pledge to me. What is our covenant? What is our pledge to the future about food waste, about species diversity, natural resources, and food? We need to make it collectively as a community, and we must do this.